So you've taken the trouble to get your amateur radio license. Whether you are studying for it just in the beginning, whether you have just got the license, or whether you've had it for years, but are interested in getting started in public service, this video is going to show you how to get started. Stick around. Black one, black one. We have four learning objectives today. First, we want to understand the relationship between amateur radio and emergency communication. We want to learn some critical terms. We'd like to be able to see some options for how you can use your radio to serve your community. And to get started, I'm going to offer you some practical advice. So before we get into it, let's first talk a little bit about my background so you can understand where I'm coming from. I, in 2012, got my first amateur radio license, which is the same year I got my first GMRS license. We'll talk about that. I have been a traffic handler, which is to say a message relay station, since 2012. I've been active with NTS, the National Traffic System, as well as Radio Relay International. I've been active with the Amateur Radio Emergency Service since 2013 and have held several leadership positions in the Ohio section since that time. I am CERT qualified, that is the Community Emergency Response Team. I am a National Weather Service trained uh, severe weather spotter. I'm a shares operator, a military operator, and I have been leading the Black Swan communication exercises and the training that goes with it. So when we're talking about emergency communication, sometimes somebody will say, well, I've just got the radio and then I've got it in case of an emergency. I'll use it then. I don't have to worry about a license because if it's an emergency, this thing's going to save me. The fact is, it's not. It's not going to go very far. If you don't have the operating experience to understand what it can do for you and what it can't do for you, if you don't have a plan, if you don't understand what frequencies are, if you don't know how to be able to coordinate with others, it's not going to do you any good. That means if you want to be able to communicate in an emergency, you have to be practiced at communicating when it's not an emergency. The purpose of amateur radio is set forth in Title 47 of the Code of Federal Regulations. That's where the FCC's regulations live. We're not going to talk about the last four reasons for the amateur radio service. They are all legitimate, but the purpose of this video is to focus on the very first one, and that is emergency communication. It's a little bit wordy, but there's a few things that we can focus on to understand what this is really all about. First, we're talking about value to the public. Voluntary, non-commercial communication service and providing emergency communications. Before we get going, you're going to need to understand some common terms. So let's first talk about terms that you'll hear that refer to organizations. The first three that we're going to talk about are organizations specific to radio operations. The ARRL is the American Radio Relay League. It organizes many programs and services advocating amateur radio. Radio Relay International supports the operation of amateur radio message relay services. And REACT International, which is an association of teams of skilled communications volunteers. In addition, there are non-government organizations that have a broader mission but will use radio and use amateur radio to be able to support those missions. Examples include the American Red Cross, which is a disaster relief organization, of course, and the Salvation Army, again, providing disaster relief services and can use amateur radio in support of that mission. There are also government organizations that will use radio volunteers, and that includes amateur radio service. The emergency management agencies that we have typically at the county level are the most obvious. They could also be multi-county organizations, or they could be statewide, or they could even be federal. FEMA, for example, does also have uh, radio service, and amateur radio is part of the picture uh, that FEMA has in mind for communication in an emergency. There are, of course, other organizations, but this gives you an idea of where we can begin. In addition to the organizations, there are programs that will require some quick explanation. 
Ares, NTS, Oxcom, HWN, Skywarn, CERT. Again, where we have programs where communication is the service, we have three that we can look at as examples. One is ARIES, the Amateur Radio Emergency Service. It's a program of the ARRL. It is organized through the Sections Field Organization. We also have NTS, the National Traffic System, which is a program of the ARRL. It is organized also through the Sections Field Organization. And it is also supported by Radio Relay International's system of nets and the independent traffic nets that help to relay messages in the amateur radio service. Oxcom is just an abbreviation for auxiliary communication. You'll see that typically in government uh, operations. An EMA, for example, will typically have its volunteers organized as Oxcom. A fairly common question is, what is the difference among these various options? We can summarize it very succinctly if we look at ARIES as the program that has operators positioned with stations in locations that are needed. That can be in the field, it could be at a shelter, for example, it could be at an emergency operations center. The NTS is going to be focused on having operators available to move messages from one place to another. So where ARIES has everybody on the same net able to hear one another, NTS provides the glue that can tie one net to another over a longer distance. OXCOM is a concept more than a program. Each individual agency may organize its volunteers under the OXCOM concept. Thus, an ARIES operator will need to be able to perform functions like origination of messages and delivery of messages very well. The ARIES operator should also understand NTS procedure, so that if a message needs to go a longer distance, the ARIES operator at the field site would be able to enter an NTS net and get the message on its way. NTS operators likewise need to understand the conditions that the ARIES programs are working in so that they can provide proper support. OXCOM is going to be an operator working on behalf of an agency. So whatever is going to be needed to perform that agency's need, the operator will do. That may mean entering an NTS net. It may mean organizing nets independent specific to a particular incident that's being managed. In any case, the skills developed in ARIES and NTS will aid an operator working in an OXCOM concept. There are, of course, also programs that provide their service via radio communication. And that would include the Hurricane Watch Net, which is coordinated volunteers who take reports by radio and relay them into the National Hurricane Center. Skywarn, which is a National Weather Service storm spotter network, and many storm spotters coordinate their efforts and make their reports by amateur radio. There's also CERT, the Community Emergency Response Team. Those are typically organized by your local EMA, and those are teams of qualified volunteers that will provide some basic support for themselves and their communities in the first critical hours after a disaster before more advanced help is on the way. And also, as we round out the quick review of terms, we need to look at radio services. There is, of course, amateur radio. As we described, that is an individually licensed service for non-commercial communication by volunteers. There is also RACES, the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service. RACES is a subset. It is a, a part of amateur radio, and it is not as large as amateur radio. It is specifically focused on using licensed volunteers for civil defense agencies, which we now typically refer to as emergency management agencies. GMRS, the General Mobile Radio Service, is another radio service that is defined by the FCC. 
This one is in part 95, the personal radio services. It is individually licensed and it provides some communication capabilities that can be very useful in an emergency. Other services defined in Part 95 of the FCC regulation include FRS, the Family Radio Service, MERS, the Multi-Use Radio Service, and Citizens Band Radio Service. All of those are licensed by rule, which is to say that the individual does not need to take a license or to hold a license, but by the rule allows for people under certain conditions to operate in those services. There are also commercial and public safety radio services, of course, under various provisions. Those are all managed by the FCC and licensed to an organization so that any user within the organization, subject to certain operating rules, may use the radio service. Then we have the government radio services, such as the Shares HF radio service that is organized by the Department of Homeland Security. And we also have MARS, the Military Auxiliary Radio System, and that is organized by the Department of Defense. Again, this is not an exhaustive list of all radio services, but as you are working in public service, you may, as an amateur radio operator, occasionally encounter some of these others or find a need to work with them. So in talking about finding options to serve your community, the first thing you're going to need to do is to connect to your community and who's actually out there providing the kinds of service that you are interested in helping to support. You can start out by looking for your local organization affiliates, the ARRL. There's a feature on the ARRL.org website where you can find your section. The ARRL's territory is in North America. It's broken into 71 administrative sections, and so that'll help you to find the section that is appropriate for you. There's, of course, also the American Red Cross. There's sheriff's offices locally. Lots of options available to you, and some looking around might give you some ideas. Another option, of course, is to look by program participants. For example, Skywarn or CERT. Again, looking at the National Weather Service, the offices that are closest to you, the one that serves your area, you may find that they are offering classes for training storm spotters, and that would be a way that you can connect with the groups there. And of course, your local CERT team, which may be coordinated, might be the training that comes from your local EMA. It might also come from your sheriff's office. Again, depending on where you are, that might be a program that's active for you, or you might have some equivalent that is being uh, offered locally. All right, for getting started, some practical advice. You want to set yourself up for success. There are plenty of volunteers who get started and they manage to burn themselves out in very little time. My advice is to think big, but act small. You don't want to forget that all these sorts of things need to work together. You need to be able to talk to people, not just locally, but you might need to make some long distance communications as well. Those are things that are useful to think about, but when it comes to the practicing of your skills, the development of your skills, and how you're going to work day to day, it's going to be very local. It's going to be small. And so focus there at least first. Once you've taken a look at what some of the options available to you are, it might be a local Aries group, an amateur radio club, it might be a CERT team, there are plenty of options, and you should take a look at what they are. I would recommend that after surveying them, maybe visiting them, talking to some people, decide on one. Start there. Start small. Focus there. Develop that expertise. That moves us on to our next item. Master a skill that's going to take time. It's going to take focus. And then once you have mastered the skill, you'll be able to maintain it without spending quite as much time as you would be when you are acquiring the skill. In so doing, that will give you time to move on to another skill without dropping the old one. In fact, these are perishable skills, so you'll need to keep up the practice, but you'll need to be able to build on top of the training that you already have to be able to integrate them together and become the most valuable volunteer that you can. The last thing, and it might be the most important, is a matter of your mindset. You choose when you start in an organization or in a program. 
you choose when you leave an organization or a program. In the meantime, when you are a volunteer, you are working for that organization, you are working in that program. That means that you don't get to decide onesie twosie if I'm going to do this task or that task. You're going to have to commit to what it is that you as a volunteer need to do to support that organization or that program. So that's the quick rundown on how to use your amateur radio skills and operating privileges for public service. Take a look below. I will have a lot of references that you can follow if you are interested in finding more information about any of the items that I've mentioned. If you've got things that are happening in your area that I did not mention that are worth talking about, please do comment. Let other people know what's going on. This was not intended to be an exhaustive survey of everything going on in the United States. It's meant to help people to get started. I hope that you found this useful. I hope that you find other videos on the channel useful. Please like and point the video to others if you think that it will be helpful to them. And I'll see you in a future video. This is Radio KD8 TTE out.